Like you, I am more bacteria than I am human cells. Well, at least in terms of numbers. Those bits of biology help determine my state of well-being. But we're learning that our health is also affected by the cumulative influence of our environment, what's being called the exposome. So, along with my native cells, there's my microbiome and exposome. I feel an identity crisis coming on. I'm Seth Shostak. I'm Molly Bentley. Welcome to Big Picture Science, produced at the SETI Institute, where researchers investigate the nature and origin of life. On Big Picture Science, we give you the wide-angle view on science and technology. You're not only hanging with your omies, but you can't escape them. Your microbiome and your exposome are a part of you. They influence your health and the development of disease or the prevention thereof. But how much of what makes up these two ohms is under your control? In this episode, your microbiome, your exposome, fecal transplants, smart toilets, and swapping microbes with your close friends and family. Plus, evidence that your microbiome may originate before birth. It's You Are Exposed. This is how biologist Rob Knight sees it, or rather hears it, and what he hears is a loss of valuable information. The flush of a toilet signals the loss of a tremendous amount of data, according to him, data that literally goes to waste. Our feces contain samples of our microbiome, and the tiny bacterial tenets that compose it have a powerful influence on our health. Dr. Knight, who is also professor of pediatrics, computer science, and engineering, and the director of the Center for Microbiome Innovation at the University of California in San Diego, and the co-founder of the American Gut Project, can imagine a day when what you learn about your health in a bathroom is more than just your weight. One day, smart toilets will provide analysis of your microbiome with every flush. And by the way, some microbes even influence the reading on that bathroom scale. Now Dr. Knight's team has found an unexpected link between microbes and a suite of complicated disorders, including neurological diseases such as Parkinson's. He talked about that and gave us the big microbiome picture when we spoke to him at the 2018 meeting of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Rob, we are learning a lot about our microbiome and about the microbes that live on us and in us. Are we one microbiome or are we many? We have a whole lot of totally distinct microbiomes in different parts of our bodies. And what's amazing is that we're just starting to find out how distinct these microbiomes are from one another. And do they compete with another? Are they sort of like West Side Story where you have different gangs of microbiomes that are competing for resources or are they unique populations and discrete? That's a great question and we don't actually know the answer. So, uh, for example, we know the microbes in your tongue and in your stool and on your skin are different from each other, but we don't know a lot about the details of where the boundaries are. Well, we'd hope that the microbes on your tongue and in your stool always remain discreet. Well, except you're swallowing a lot of your saliva, right? So you might expect that given that those are just two ends of the same tube, there'd be a lot more overlap than there is. Transfer back the other way, maybe not so good, but uh, certainly going one way down the gut, you'd expect a lot of that to happen. Well, you raised the question in your talks of what personal identity is and whether or not we are man, woman, or the sum of our microbes. Right, so microbiology is really starting to change how we think of ourselves as humans, right? Because under and inside our bodies, or at least what we think of as our bodies, we have more microbial cells, we have way more microbial genes. And for a lot of traits that are very intimately connected with how we think of ourselves, like say obesity, we're finding that the microbial genes have a huge impact on that. So understanding that and reframing our identity to include our microbes and to include the genes that we can change, even if we don't yet know how to change them, that's a very exciting direction. I want to be clear, when we talk about microbes, are you referring to bacteria or do you include viruses as well? I include the bacteria, the fungi, the protists, the archaea, the viruses, uh, a lot of different forms of life in there. A lot of what you see right now is mostly based around the bacteria because that's the large majority of life that's living inside you. And also it's a lot easier to study with the techniques we have right now. But there's certainly examples where those other kinds of organisms play very important roles, both harmful and beneficial. Now you talked here at the AAAS about the role of the microbiome in health and disease. Mm-hmm. And well, let's say more about your studies into um, Park Parkinson's in particular. Now, I understand that studies have been done where you've transferred 
bacteria from a patient with Parkinson's into mice, and then the mice start exhibiting the disease? That's right. So they have the same sorts of motor deficits and the same kinds of changes in the brain that resemble humans, uh, human Parkinson's. So just, just for clarification, the work in the mice was done at Caltech by a collaborator, Sarkis Masmanian, on the project. And what's amazing about that is once you know that you can transmit the disease from humans into mice by transmitting the bacteria, that gives you a great toolbox because then you can ask what bacterial species and what bacterial genes are involved in that. How did you transmit the bacteria from the humans to the mice? Uh, fecal sample then delivered into the mice. Well, I want to follow up on that because, as you said, there's this tube that runs through us from, mm-hmm. from the mouth to the other end. And if you are using fecal transplants to insert bacteria into mice, how might it create a neurological disorder on the other end of the body and also go past the blood-brain barrier? There's a lot of different ways that the microbes in your gut signal to your brain that have been worked out in different conditions. So in mouse models of autism, the dysfunctional gut bacteria produce a molecule called 4-EPS, and that diffuses into the brain and causes harmful effects. There's mouse models of depression where you can use lactobacillus to treat depression in a mouse, but that only works if the vagus nerve is intact, so it seems to be signaling through the nervous system directly. Then in Parkinson's, what we're seeing is differences in short-chain fatty acids, notably butyrate, which then, for some reason, and the mechanism of this is not fully worked out, but it seems to affect microglial activity in the brain. So basically it could be a chemical signal or an immune signal, and we don't know which. There's good reasons to believe it could be either or both at this point. So it sounds like what happens in the vagus nerve doesn't stay in vagus. Right, exactly. John Cryan, who's uh, one of the pioneers in gut brain, likes to make that point in the slides. (laughs) So that joke's been made. All right. Well, it sounds like then the future of disease uh, diagnosis may rest on whether we can determine if our microbiome is sick. That's right, although it's very much the future of disease diagnosis rather than something you can do right now. So in the context of a clinical research study, we can diagnose a lot of diseases with high accuracy within that population that we're looking at by the microbiome. And that's not just things like obesity and IBD, but things like cirrhosis, uh, Parkinson's, MS. But that doesn't mean that you can look at the same bacteria and then uh, do either a citizen science test like American Gut or a commercial test and look up the same bacteria and necessarily necessarily know that you have the disease or not, Uh, like this long regulatory pathway between what we can do in a research study and what leads to an FDA-approved test that's able to diagnose that disease. Interesting that you bring up the FDA. I was fascinated to learn in your talk if we can return to the subject Uh of feces. Uh I love that subject, so we can talk about it as much as your audience will tolerate. (laughs) Okay, here we go. Well, I was fascinated to learn that the, the FDA is regulating feces as a drug. As a drug. That's right, and it's uh, difficult to prove that you manufactured feces under the conditions that you manufacture, say, Tylenol. Why would feces be regulated as a drug? Because of the potential efficacy in treating disease through fecal transplants? Correct. So the FDA regulates as a drug any substance that's shown to modify a clinical endpoint. And feces has been shown to modify how sick people are if they have C. diff. Therefore, it's a drug under the FDA guidelines. C. diff. The Clostridium difficile, so it's a particularly nasty form of antibiotic-resistant bug that's more and more picked up in the hospitals these days. Okay, the follow-up question, which way does the fecal transplant make its way into your body? It's been done by either what's referred to as the northern route, where you come in from the top, or the southern route, when you go up from below. And both of those have been remarkably effective in clinical trials. Uh, There's a lot of debate about how exactly you should do it. Research on that question is greatly hampered by the regulatory burden. But on the other hand, given that we know that it does have a profound effect on at least one disease state, and there's been published data in other diseases like IBD and even autism, it does make sense to take care and do the research carefully rather than just rushing into it. Okay, well, at the risk of turning our listeners off their lunch, one of the images that you showed was what looked like a fecal popsicle. Uh Popsicles are meant to be eaten. (laughs) Right, so in that case, the fecal popsicle is thawed out by the gastroenterologist who then delivers it by endoscopy. And if your listeners are not eating lunch right now, essentially what that means is that the tube is going to go into your butt and it's going to be delivering it to some specific location in your intestine. Why would a fecal transplant be so effective in helping mitigate disease? 
Uh, it's so effective because a lot of people have bacteria that don't make the right chemicals or make too much of the wrong chemicals. And if you think about it, not as war against the bacteria, but rather as an ecosystem that you're managing, resupplying necessary components of that ecosystem and changing the balance of the nutrients that the ecosystem needs to remain healthy makes a lot of sense conceptually. And so then a lot of the details are in how you do it exactly, especially given that everyone's ecosystem internally is different. Well, it, it's interesting you say that because I understand that there is now a trend of DIY fecal transplants. People are trying to do this at home, and this raises the risk of transferring other diseases such as HIV and hepatitis. So one has to proceed with caution. Yeah, absolutely. So when you do a stool transplant in a medical context, what's going to happen is that stool will be screened for a whole range of blood-borne and stool-borne diseases. Any of those diseases, in principle, can be transmitted by a fecal transplant, which can also have blood in it. And so as a result, you want to be really, really careful about that kind of screening and make sure that all of those tests have been done at a clinically relevant level. Well, finally, Rob, I wonder if you could give us a a portrait of the future and how we might be doing very quick analyses on our microbiome. Can you just give us an overview of how routine this might become? Yeah, what we're hoping is that uh, we can get it out of the state it is at the moment where you need million-dollar instruments in the lab to do the DNA analysis and the chemical analysis. And instead, at least the chemical analysis, we think that'll be the kind of thing that you can do at home, perhaps as simply as breathing on a mirror and doing chemical analysis of your breath, or perhaps having a smart toilet where as soon as you flush, it's going to do some instant analysis of the chemistry and deliver those results back to you on your smartphone, which, let's face it, I bet you're using in there anyway. And this sort of thing already happens at the airport. So if you've been at the airport and they swiped a little thing in your bag and then took it away to test it for explosives, that was a mass spec based assay. So this is a technology that's already got consumer applications. Uh, You get the results in a few seconds. A large part of the problem is in trying to interpret the results and to link it to something that's relevant for the microbiome and for disease. But that's what we're working on right now. Rob Knight, thank you so much for speaking with us. Uh, Thanks again for having me. Rob Knight is Professor of Pediatrics, Computer Science and Engineering, and Director of the Center for Microbiome Innovation at the University of California, San Diego. Well, smart toilet, Seth makes going into the bathroom a little intimidating, I think, even if it's in the name of science. Well, yeah, but it's an improvement over the current technology where they give you these, you know, little, I don't know, swatches of something, and you're supposed to take a, a little sample of your stool and send that away to a lab. I mean, I find that much more off-putting than to think that the toilet does all the dirty work itself. I think that's a, a great move. And, and by the way, have you been to Japan? I have not, no. Well, they, I, I have seen some uh, toilets in Japan that are more advanced than your average 747. I mean, they're very advanced. You know, they play uh, tweeting birds and stuff like that, and they have all these knobs and dials. I mean, you need a 300-page f- instruction book just to use the toilet. I figure if anybody can build this thing, the Japanese can, and, uh, you know, it's probably a good thing. Okay, well, those toilets sound like fun. The tweeting bird, I will have to think about that and investigate it. But those toilets cannot do feces analyses. They cannot. Yet. No, okay. not yet. But believe me, I mean, you know, they've got the technology. Now, the only thing is, you know, you do have to plug in your toilet. What? Well, I mean, it needs a source of power. To do this analysis. Yeah, 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 yeah. These, are, these things are not steam-powered. You don't wind them up. <laughs> So the future of disease diagnosis may come down to testing the health of your microbiome. Coming up, how research into social animals such as gazelles suggests that your health is influenced by whom you hang out with. So pick your friends carefully. It's You Are Exposed on Big Picture Science. Okay, you BiPiSci listeners know a lot about us, Molly, Gary, Barbara, and me, but we'd like to know a few things about you. No, we're not going to send telemarketers your way or fill your inbox with bizarro spam, but we'd like to make sure that our program really comports with your discriminating tastes. So here's the deal. 
go to survey.libsyn.com slash arewealone and spend the half minute or so it will take to fill out our survey. Three of you will be randomly chosen to receive a highly coveted SETI Institute t-shirt for your trouble, suitable for wearing around the house or at the rendering plant. That's survey.libsyn, L-I-B as in boy, S-Y-N dot com slash are we alone. We'll appreciate it, and you'll have a shot at sartorial splendor. It takes guts to be a gazelle. After all, you're surrounded by hungry predators such as lions, cheetahs, African wild dogs out there on the savannas. It turns out it also takes gut microbes to be a gazelle. Ecologist Vanessa and Zenwa's research in Kenya on these highly social animals reveals how their palling around allows for transmission of tiny passengers that influence health and disease. Dr. Zenwa's work suggests that your close social group and the microbes they carry influence the composition of your own microbiome and that the benefits of being social outweigh the costs. But there are some costs. We spoke with Dr. Zenwa at the 2018 American Association for the Advancement of Science meeting where she presented her results. Vanessa, will you study the role of social behavior and the health of gazelles? Why gazelles? So gazelles are pretty interesting because they're highly social and what I like about them most is that they're social in a lot of different ways. So some gazelles spend more time with a lot of other gazelles than others. We actually find gazelles that like to hang out on their own. Um, So they're in a group of one and there's gazelles that like to hang out with a lot of others. So just like we vary maybe in how social we are, gazelles also vary. What is it like to watch gazelles running across the savanna? It's really exciting uh, to go out and sort of follow gazelles and watch them for long periods of time. But on the other hand, gazelles are a little bit boring. They spend about 40% of their time eating. (laughs) The other percent of the time they spend sitting down or just standing looking around. So it's a lot of just watching the savanna. But there's always surprises when you watch gazelles because, you know, there might be an elephant that comes in. You might see a lion or a cheetah. So a lot of excitement happens when we're sitting watching gazelles eating. Okay, well, let's talk about the the benefits of being a social gazelle. We're learning a lot about the human microbiome, and it turns out, no surprise, that gazelles, another animal, also have a microbiome. How do gazelles share microbes? For most wild animals that have been studied and even people, when you're social, there's a lot of physical contact, right? And that could be the mechanism by which these microbes get shared. So for instance, there have been studies in primates that show that when they groom each other more, which is what they do socially, that helps transmit the microbes. Well, except for mother and offspring and mating adult male and female gazelles, Gazelles never have physical contact. (laughs) Um, So we were quite surprised that just like these other species, the members of your social group tend to influence your microbiome. So the effect is maybe not as large as people have seen for physically contacting species, but the effect is still there. So that tells us that social bonds are important for sharing microbes, even when there's not a lot of physical contact. And it could just be spending a lot of time in close proximity to one another. I wonder if we could talk a bit more about that so we can get a picture of how these uh, microbes, and I assume we're talking about bacteria, not necessarily viruses. Yes, we studied bacteria solely in this study. Now, I don't know if the bacteria are jumping from gazelle to gazelle. Perhaps they're doing gazelle-like jumps from gazelle to gazelle. Or maybe they are being transmitted through the fecal matter into the environment. And then if you're eating grass, then you're ingesting those microbes. Yeah, so that's really our hypothesis as to how the sharing happens, that it's a fecal-oral transmission route. Gazelles that live together spend a lot of time together. They all poop in the same place and they eat where they poop. And that leads potentially to the transmission that's socially mediated. 
How, how do you collect the, the microbes on gazelles? I suppose you walk around in the, in the areas where they've been eating and, and defecating and collect samples? What we actually do is we spend a lot of time sitting and watching gazelles. And we have all of our gazelles individually identified. And so when a given individual defecates, we actually go up to that individual and pick up its fecal sample. So we know exactly who pooped when. <laughs> have you ever touched a gazelle? Yes, because we have to also catch these gazelles. So at certain time points, we catch them in order to do certain experiments, like an experiment that involved treating the gazelles with a drug that cured them of their worm infections. What does their coat feel like? Oh, it's really soft. So I like to think that gazelles are as beautiful and silky up close as they are when you watch them on National Geographic. <laughs> Well, getting down to the benefits and versus the undesirable effects of sharing your microbiome with other gazelles, what does the science say? What our science says is that on one hand, being social increases your likelihood of getting infected with things like parasitic worms and pathogenic bacteria. But in the other hand, it's conferring what I like to call hidden benefits. And in the case of the bacteria, we see that socially transferred bacteria potentially contribute to our ability to metabolize the food that we eat or these gazelles eat. And so, that's so it's helpful, helpful bacteria? Yes. And so there's this combination of helpful and hurtful together, and we're trying to understand what are the circumstances when the helpful impacts of social behavior outweigh the hurtful impacts. So it's not so different from the human microbiome. So there's the benefit that you're going to pick up the healthy uh, bacteria of your friends, your spouse, your kids, but you also may pick up harmful bacteria. It's the same with gazelles. Yeah. What we're trying to understand is when does the picking up helpful bacteria outweigh the hurtful bacteria that you might pick up? And there's a great analogy with humans, right? And so because these gazelles are social and because we can track the positive contribution of some bacteria versus the negative contribution of others, we can really start to understand in what situations being social is most helpful in terms of minimizing the impacts of pathogens and parasites. It really sounds like the microbes are ruling the world. We think that we're in control, the animals have their own predator-prey relationship, but these microbes are in some ways the puppet masters controlling behavior perhaps, but health as well. I definitely think that these microbes are really exerting a strong influence on our health, on our behavior, etc. I think for such a long time, we ignored these components of our ecosystem, and whether that's the broader ecosystem or the ecosystem inside every one of us, including the gazelles. And so many of the effects that we see that we think are driven by the factors associated with our own traits might actually be influenced by some of these microbes and macrobes, and that's what we're trying to understand, and health is one of the key things that we're interested in. And is that why you're studying the gazelles, because you want to be able to extrapolate to human behavior, or are you studying these animals for the sake of studying these animals in particular? I love gazelles. <laughs> um, that's true. Um, but I think that they're really good models. So the degree to which they're social, the variation in their social behavior, as well as the variation in complexity of the microbes and macrobes that they have, that actually understanding these processes in uh, gazelles is potentially telling us a lot about other species as well. Other social species, now whether those are domesticated animals that we rely on for our food and other things around the world or ourselves is really social people. So I think the gazelle is a model that can tell us about wildlife in gazelles themselves, but can also potentially be uh, their lessons to be extrapolated to ourselves and to our domesticated species. Thank you so much for speaking with us. Thank you. Vanessa Izenwa is an ecologist at the University of Georgia. So we've heard how your microbiome influences a wide range of health issues, and also that your microbes aren't solely your own, but are acquired from close members of your community. There's more news about your microbiome in the big puzzler. When did you first acquire it? 
It's been thought that a baby picks up its mother's microbes at birth during its trip down the birth canal. This idea agrees with a century-long assumption that the placenta, the organ attached to the wall of the uterus providing nutrients and oxygen to a developing fetus, is sterile, just as the fetus itself and the mother's womb are sterile. Evidence now suggests that the placenta is where the microbiome begins. Microbiologist Indira Mysorker at Washington University in St. Louis and her colleagues found samples of bacteria in nearly 200 placentas collected from women giving birth. Now, since microbes trigger our immune system, her findings suggest that perhaps a crucial part of developing that system occurs during pregnancy. Some scientists are skeptical that the bacteria found in the placenta are really evidence of a placental microbiome. More likely, they say, it's contamination from testing kits. Dr. Mai Sorker explains when she started questioning the conventional wisdom that the placenta was sterile. About eight years ago, we started looking into why some babies come out early. And we wanted to ask whether there was an infection that was inside that was actually triggering this premature birth. And to test that, we started looking, actually looking at the placental organ after it was delivered to see whether we would find bacteria that might possibly be hiding inside the cells of this placenta. When we looked, we actually saw evidence of bacteria sitting inside placental cells. And then we started to see that they were in almost all placentas we looked at, even if the placentas were coming from a completely healthy baby born of a completely normal pregnancy delivered at term. Can I ask you what kind of bacteria were these? Maybe it was just some sort of very common infection. Great question. So there was no association, which means that the moms who delivered the baby in the placenta did not have any clinically diagnosed infection or any other symptom that would suggest that it was an infection. And given that we were seeing these bacteria in almost all the placentas, we started to think, well, maybe this is not infection-related. Maybe this is there normally. So what you're suggesting here is that you discovered that the fetus has its own, well, microbiome. It has its own set of bacteria. So the fetus is, of course, the, the baby, and the placenta is the structure inside the mom that takes care of the baby inside the womb. And we were looking at the placenta, and that's where we found uh, the bacteria. But since you bring up the fetus, people have been finding bacteria in the intestines, in the guts of uh, fetuses. So before they're even born, there's some bacteria in their guts. So that has set people to start thinking maybe the fetuses are getting colonized with bacteria even before they're born. And then that comes up the question, where is that coming from? Is it coming from the mother's gut? Is it coming from the mother's placenta? And those are some of the very exciting new areas of discovery and investigation going on in this field right now. Well, if we're colonized before birth, and it sounds like that's what the evidence points to, uh, doesn't that challenge the usual assumption that the placenta was sterile? And it was a barrier between, if you will, the microbes in the mother and the child, the the unborn baby. So this seems to fly in the face of that. That is correct. And the other aspects that have been coming up is if the placenta were actually sterile, as we've thought, and the baby's never seen any bacteria ever, and the first time the baby is exposed to bacteria is when it's coming down through the mother's birth canal, where it's faced with millions of microbes, and then it comes out into the outside world where they're surrounded by by microbes. How is it that they're not completely in shock? And so one reason might be that they've been exposed to small amounts of bacteria when they're inside their mother, so that when they're coming out, they've sort of been what's called immune educated. So they've seen a little bit, and so they know okay, this is normal, this is okay. And we're finding that they are actually activated immune cells in the fetus, in its intestine and in other parts of its body, which suggests that something must have activated them. And what is that? Are there microbes inside the mother's womb that it's seeing? And if so, what are they? Where are they? And I think a lot of exciting answers are going to come from those areas of investigation.
Now, Indira, this is a kind of revolutionary, I suppose. It certainly sounds that way to me. But uh, it is the case that there's been some pushback, right? I mean, there are scientists that agree with you, and there are those who are deeply skeptical who suggest that the cells that have been found here in the placenta and so forth are, uh, you know, from the testing kits. And, you know, this is just contamination. How do you respond to that? Uh, That's a good point. And I think whenever you're starting in a new area or changing the paradigm, there's always controversy and hesitation because you're changing the way people have normally thought. But the tools that we're using have been developed to study bacteria in soil, in our guts, in the vagina, where we have gazillion bacteria, where the amount is not a problem. So that's where the tools were first developed. And now we're repurposing those tools to look at very small biomass, as they called, uh, in areas like the placenta or the lung. And so I think it's a question of sensitivity. And just as on the protein side of things, we've developed newer tools where in a, a drop of blood, we can look at a number of markers that tell us about a disease. I think that genomic, genetic tools are going to be developed, which allow for highly sensitive measurement of bacteria and what are they doing, where are they, and so on. And I think that is a matter of time. So I personally don't feel there's a lot of disagreement, but uh, it's just where you're coming from. Well, let me ask you this. Where are the bacteria coming from? I mean, let's assume yeah. you're right. And, and they, those, those bacteria are right in there, and they've been there for a long time, you know, fewer than nine months, I presume. But in any case, where did they come from? Did they just come from the mother, and how did they get to the placenta? Excellent question. That's that's the billion-dollar question. So our work has shown that the majority of the bacteria that we see, this is like literally see physically, in the placenta are on the mother's side of the placenta. So the placenta, you can imagine it, it's like an umbrella, and the handle of the umbrella is the umbilical cord that's connected to the baby that's floating around in amniotic fluid. And the umbrella part is the placenta. So there's the baby side, and then there's the mom's side. The mom's side is the outside of the umbrella, okay? And the majority of the bacteria that we've seen in our studies have been on the mom's side of the placenta and not on the baby's side. Those mom's side bacteria are different, quite different, from anything that might be found in the mom's vagina. So we don't think that's where they're coming from. They have limited similarity to bacteria that are in the mom's gut, although there's so many, it's a little bit hard to pin that down. But it's possible that it's coming from the gut or her skin and or her uterus. Finally, Indira, suppose it's true that these bacteria first colonize the body before birth. What are the practical consequences of that discovery? Again, it's a question of exposure, and we've seen this a lot in children as part of the hygiene hypothesis uh, who are not exposed to a variety of of either childhood infections or just in the presence of those, that those children are much more likely to have allergies, which continue on in, in adult life. And kids who might be more at risk for infections uh, generally have fewer allergies. So there's always this balance that you don't want to have too much exposure because you could get a terrible infection and die. But if you're underexposed, then your own immune system tends to react to itself and you tend to have allergies. And later in adult life and aging, as you age, you can have autoimmune conditions. And so what you're exposed to, when you're exposed to, are all very important elements in how you react to your environment. Indira Mysorker, thanks so very much for speaking with us. You're welcome. Thank you very much for having me. Indira Mysorker is a microbiologist at Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri. Dr. Mysorker says which bacteria you're exposed to and when influences the development of your immune system, a very essential immune system. The microbiome is a big deal. Well, coming up, we're going to throw another ohm at you. The exposome is the sum total of your lifetime exposure to environmental factors, and it too influences your health. Now scientists want to measure it. Resistance to the ohm is futile. That's next. It's You Are Exposed on Big Picture Science.
We've heard about the genome, the microbiome, and even the viral virome. But we're not done with ohms. There's no place like ohm. And here's another one, the exposome. Yes, just as you were feeling pretty good about upping your intake of yogurt to maintain your microbiome, you're presented with a suite of influential health factors and, like your inherited microbes, some components are not under your control. Think of exposome as exposure plus the Greek word for body, soma. The exposome is a way of capturing the information about our environment. So we know that who we are is a combination of our genome and our exposures, and that's what the exposome is capturing, that complement of the non-genetic forces that act upon us. The fact that environment influences health is not new, but gathering together and assessing all environmental factors over a lifetime, your diet, the quality of air you breathe, contact with chemicals, and measuring your exposure is. And now we're finding that your exposome can alter your microbiome. All these factors are coming together in the lab of Gary Miller, professor of public health at the Rollins School of Public Health at Emory University and director of its Hercules Exposome Research Center. The concept of the exposome started out as really looking at that lifelong exposure. We've decided to take some smaller bites at it, is that we want to measure what we can measure in a person today. So if you went into your doctor's office, what can we find out about what your current level of exposure is? And so the idea is that if we can take a blood sample or a urine sample, we can measure all the chemicals that are in your body at this time. As far as reconstructing the past, that does become trickier. Um, There's many chemicals that stay in the body for a long time. And so if you have it in you now, you probably got exposed over the course of decades. And we acknowledge we may miss some of those past exposures. Ideally, you would have like an annual visit to the doctor. And if you did this over time, you would then kind of accumulate that lifelong exposure. But initially, we think the first step is really trying to figure out what a person looks like today. So what's new about this? Because, Gary, I you know, if I fill up my car at the local gas station. Here in California, there might be a sign on the pump that says this product contains chemicals that are known to the state of California to cause cancer, presumably breathing the vapors that you might have next to a gas pump. You know, it might be bad for you, but but that's been done for a long, long time. What's new in the exposome research of today? I think the big change is that if you look back to what pollution was like, you know, 30 or 40 years ago in, in California, and lead levels, for example, when we were using leaded paint and leaded gasoline, we've gotten rid of many of the high levels of very toxic chemicals. And now the bigger concern is the fact that we're exposed to thousands of chemicals at lower levels. And so individually, these chemicals may not be doing very much, but when they combine together, they have a health effect. And the challenge is that we're very good at seeing what one chemical does at a time, but we're not very good at seeing what thousands do at a time. And the exposome is trying to capture how all these different influences are impacting health. So I would think that as a citizen, I I would hear about this, this research and think, oh, yeah, that's all stuff we ought to be looking at. But how do I gauge my own vulnerability here? Do you have a kind of a cumulative number that encapsulates the risk of all these things and maybe weights them by by danger or something? I mean, how do I know whether I'm doing all right or not doing all right if there are thousands of factors? I think this is one of the goals of this type of research is that we believe that we can set up a kind of scoring system that gives a general overview picture of your environmental health. But to do that, it requires a lot of information, right? So the idea is that we want to be able to collect our scientific research data on thousands of people to determine what normal is, and then from that, kind of go to that next step. So I think that what I would envision in in five or 10 years is that you could send your sample to a company or your doctor, and they would be able to give you these sorts of scores that say, you know, when you look at metals, you have a higher than normal of exposure, or pesticides are higher, or certain plasticizers are higher, and then develop strategies to reduce your exposures to those chemicals. Okay, but I would think that uh, it would depend quite a bit on maybe very local circumstances. If I live next to a a freeway, for example, I I might have a lot of particulate matter from trucks uh, getting into my lungs or something like that, whereas if I live, you know, three miles away, I, I, I might not. I mean, it sounds like there's tremendous variability, not to mention variability from one country to another, right? 
And this is why I think we need to do these at an individual level. So the idea is that for an individual person, there's probably certain exposures that are having a greater threat to their health, which could also be based on their genetic vulnerability. But it's very hard to just take averages of populations and make these decisions. So the idea is that in a sort of precision medicine paradigm, like you would say, here's a person that they are having a health concern, you assess their exposures, you develop strategies to minimize them, and then you see if that's actually improving their health outcomes. What is prompting this research now? Is it simply the realization that the exposome, you know, uh, exists and is, is significant? Well, I, I think one of the big drivers of it was the incredible success of the Human Genome Project, where we show we could actually get all this great detail in the genomics, which was a huge scientific advance. As we start analyzing the data, we start learning more that for many complex diseases, the genomics can only account like for maybe a fourth of the causation. And so what's the rest of it? You know, it's the unanswered part of the genome studies that really drive the exposome research. So I like to look at this as thinking about studies where they've studied a population of people that they've done all the genome analysis on. And so when you then add the environmental part on, you know what that genetic makeup is of those individuals. And so we really want to partner with geneticists to get that very good genetic information to help us interpret the impact of these environmental chemicals. You know, a lot of the questions you're asking about doing these things in humans can be very challenging. But my laboratory is actually using the nematode C. elegans to model many of these things. So the idea is that we can study the exposome of this small worm that we can systematically mutate their genes. And so it's a really good way to scientifically look at those gene by environment interactions in this way that we just can't do in humans and helps us like kind of test the hypotheses of does this gene increase the vulnerability to this chemical? Well, one question that occurs to me is how we're exposed. I mean, uh, I, I can understand stuff that we breathe and I can understand stuff that we might, you know, swallow or whatever. How do things get into you other than the obvious ways? You know, the air that we breathe, you know, we're bringing in a lot of air during our day and, and the food and the water that we're consuming, these are really the major drivers of it. While dermal exposures do occur, and they can lead to many of the exposures, for example, through personal care products, right? So the shampoos and the hair dyes sort of things that are used, you do have exposures that way. And I think when you kind of look at that, uh, the ingestion part, the breathing part, and that dermal absorption, those are the biggest ways of the sort of chemical exposures. I mean, we are exposed to all sorts of different types of radiation throughout the day, and we're exposed to various stressors too. So even a psychosocial sort of stressor, like a stressful event, changes the chemistry in our body. And these are things that we want to capture in part of the exposome. Now, not all exposure, I presume, is detrimental. Uh, you might be exposed to, to clean air, or you might have a low-stress lifestyle, or you know, eat broccoli regularly. Do exposome studies include such things? I mean, can you improve your score rather than just see it go down as you get exposed to things? I think from a research standpoint, this is one of the most important parts of the exposome, is that the way that we've approached exposures, we always view it as negative. And that's kind of a biased way of doing this. The exposome is very unbiased, is I would hope that part of the results of our studies would show that there's certain plant chemicals or sources in our diet that are actually protective to health. And, and I think that is part, like we think there are many positive aspects of it. Um, we know, for example, from the diet, we know from other studies that foods that are rich in antioxidants or nicotinic type compounds can have a protective effect on health. And it's just a matter of doing this in a systematic and unbiased way. You say nicotinic uh, compounds. Uh, are those cigarettes? What, what are nicotinic compounds? So, well, nicotine obviously is in cigarettes, and I would never encourage anyone to smoke cigarettes because it increases your risk of like 200 diseases. But uh, there are like nicotinic compounds in peppers and different things in the diet, and those, some of those compounds have been shown to decrease the risk of certain diseases. And so it's there are healthful ways of getting some of these compounds into your body without the detrimental effects of something as bad as cigarette smoke. What about internal biological factors that are also shaped by the environment? Do we know how the exposome might interact with the microbiome? I mean, is there some example of that? So this, there's some really great examples of that is that 
your microbiome, for example, it's in your intestines, is anything you eat in your diet that goes into your intestines is essentially going to have to pass through your microbiome before it gets into your bloodstream. And so many of the chemicals that we see in our bodies are postmicrobial. that the idea that these guts in our intestines have modified the chemicals in some way. And so in that way, they're affecting it. But we also know that certain chemicals that we're exposed to can alter our microbiome. And so there's a very bi-directional effect there where the microbiome can affect the chemical exposure and the chemical exposure can actually affect the microbiome. That sounds to me like it suggests a method of maybe dealing with the exposome by modifying the microbiome. Do you see that as a possibility in the future? Well, you know, just swallow this stuff twice a day. It'll change your microbiome, but it'll filter out all the bad things you're breathing in. There's actually some really interesting data where modification of diet changes our gut microbiome and actually decreases the bad metabolism of certain chemicals. And so the idea is that it's not just about the chemicals that you see initially, it's what they turn into inside your body. And so I think you're right. I think that things that make a positive microbiome can minimize the effect of chemicals in our environment. Well, finally, Gary, People have been living with these exposome dangers for a long time, at least some of them, centuries at least, really. So how serious a threat are they? I mean, I I know that this is a tough question to answer, but if we eliminated all these exposome factors, at least the malevolent ones, would the average lifetime actually increase very much? When you think about that, you have to think about what aspect of diseases are preventable. And we know that A lot of heart disease, a lot of diabetes and things that affect millions of people have very preventable causes and things we can do about it. Again, I don't view the exposome as being a malevolent force. The idea, it is everything that's around you, the good and the bad. And the idea is shifting yourself towards a more positive side of it. So the idea that you drive more towards health and away from the disease, it's not about eliminating any of these things because a great example of this is that If you eat a diet that's rich in antioxidants and fish diet sort of things, you may increase your exposure to mercury. But we know that the overall health effect is beneficial. So it meant even though you might be increasing your mercury exposure, the benefit of the diet outweighs that. It's not about eliminating everything that's bad. It's about shifting from good to better. Gary Miller, thanks so very much for speaking with us. You're welcome. Gary Miller is professor of public health at the Rollins School of Public Health and director of the Hercules Exposome Research Center at Emory University. As of August 2018, his lab will be located at Columbia University. Well, a lot of ohms in this show. What we're learning, though, what we've learned, is that science is challenging the notion of the individual, that we are not just an individual. We are a collection of our microbes and our viruses, and we're also the sum total of the exposure to our environment. Yeah, and that's something new. I mean, really, a hundred years ago, we knew something about biology. We knew we were made of cells, and, you know, individuals were a big collection of cells. You know, it's a species, and you're a member of the species, and now it turns out you're an entire ecosystem because you got a, you got your gut microbe, and you got your, you know, exposome, and you've got you know, your genome, of course, and I always figured the genome genome was all that really counted. Well, that's pretty naive, isn't it? So, yeah, that's really astounding, in particular that your microbiome, which are these these things living inside you, bacteria, viruses, that they can affect you not in the areas where they're located, but they can give you a disease that you would think would have nothing to do with the kind of microscopic uh, organisms that might be living in your gut. Right, such as neurological diseases like Parkinson's. And then the idea that these microbes are also being influenced by, for example, your chemical exposure. So your exposome is influencing your microbiome as well. It kind of reminds me of uh, epigenetic factors, you know, that you you have all these genes and you think, okay, that's the blueprint. We're going to build everything according to that blueprint. But it turns out that factors outside the blueprint affect you know, how these uh, genes are expressed, and that can mess you up or improve you or whatever. So we're, once again, very, very complex. And, you know, I think the promise here is seeing the effects of these ohms, but once you see the effects, the next thing you ask is, how do they wreak those effects? 
And the step after that is how can we control their effects and improve things? Well, thanks to the duo who helped produce Big Picture Science and whose names we will now expose, Senior Producer Gary Niederhoff and Operations Manager Barbara Vance. Thanks also to financial support from Rena Shulsky David and Sammy David and to the William K. Bose Jr. Foundation. Big Picture Science is produced at the SETI Institute, a nonprofit scientific and education organization whose scientists study the origin and nature of life. And a big thanks also to our listeners. Your ears have been attuned to an episode of Big Picture Science that is called You Are Exposed. If you'd like to hear more Big Picture Science episodes, well, you'll find them in our archive at bigpicturescience.org. You can also find links there to our guests. And if you're a podcast listener but prefer listening to over-the-air radio because you like being exposed to the air, Check out the listing on our website of the more than 140 radio stations that carry the program. And if your local radio station is not on that list, consider letting them know you like the show. And if you never want to miss an episode, well, subscribe to Bye Pi Sci on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. You can also find us on Facebook and Twitter. And to reach us directly with your comments, and we always ask for a little bit of faint praise, email it all to bigpicturescience at SETI.org. 